Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. We have a very special guest this week, like we often do. It's Bishop Scott McKaig. Welcome, Bishop Scott. It's wonderful to be back, to be here with you. Yeah, it's yes. great to have you back, Bishop Scott. Last time Bishop Scott was here, he wasn't a bishop. <laughs> he was the uh, general moderator of the Companions of the Cross, which is a new religious order in Canada, and wonderful, wonderful community. And they send their seminarians to uh, Sacred Heart Seminary, where I teach. And Bishop Scott and myself and others in Renewal Ministries have been partners in the gospel for a long time. Bishop Scott has helped us in our mission work in a significant way. He's had a very significant role in Ethiopia and other countries. And But uh, since we've last seen Bishop Scott here on the TV program, he's become a bishop. Yes. <laughs> and he's the bishop of the military ordinariate in Canada. So Bishop Scott, catch us up a little bit about what's been happening since the last time you were here on The Choice. Yes, well, my life changed rather dramatically on, uh, on Divine Mercy Sunday uh, during the Jubilee of Mercy in the year 2016. Got a phone call from the papal nuncio and asked to, to speak with me briefly after one of the services for uh, the celebration of Divine Mercy Sunday. And at first I thought he was asking me for, you know, potential names of, of members of the community that might make good bishops. And uh, he completely shocked me by turning to me and said, uh, you've been appointed a bishop <laughs> by Pope, Pope Francis, you know. So, yeah, uh, a huge shock, didn't, didn't see it coming. And especially the military um, uh, diocese in Canada, because uh, I would have assumed before that that uh, it would be taken from amongst the military chaplains. But I guess this time they wanted to shake things up a bit and bring in an outsider, so to speak. So Not only an outsider, but somebody <clears throat> from this radical new community that's <laughs> charismatic, Eucharistic, Marian, and evangelistic. Yes, and, and I think the, uh, the experience that I've had in the new evangelization and promoting the new evangelization, our work with uh, so many of the new movements, you know, not only uh, Renewal Ministries, mm -hmm. done about 15 different mission trips all over the world, um, but also Catholic Christian Outreach, yeah, which is, ministry. yeah, it's the Canadian version of Focus yeah. uh, Ministries, Net Youth Ministries. You, you yourself were part of that. I was, you? yes, my first full year as a Catholic in 1987-88 was on Net Ministries. Yeah. So, so I think the, uh, the experience that I had in promotion of new evangelization, of moving the church out of a Christendom model of ministry, a maintenance model, um, into uh, a, an apostolic model, you know, a missionary model, is uh, one of the reasons it was given to me for my appointment. So, yeah, yeah. How's it going? It's going well. It's a completely different kind of ministry than I've ever done. Uh, ministering with the troops is fantastic. They are such an amazing group of men and women uh, serving, protecting our freedoms in the, in the West. And uh, Canada has a, a smaller military, of course, in the United States. Our population is about a tenth of the U.S. And so that's reflected. But it's a very mobile force uh, deployed all over the world. And um, so I find myself traveling all the time, mm. uh, coast to coast in Canada, uh, I visited the troops in Kuwait uh, over, over Christmas break. I uh, didn't get into Iraq because the battle for Mosul had just begun, so there were security concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine, uh, as well as Operation Reassurance in, in the Mediterranean, I visited Crete and the Navy there. Yeah. So it must be wonderful for uh, the Canadian troops to have a bishop like you visit them, you know, who's alive and 
you know, everything. <laughs> well, I don't know what I have to offer, but you, you have to trust God's goodness. Yeah, well, you, we offer your dedicated life and you offer Jesus Christ, you know, yeah. which is you know, tremendous. Yeah. And that's what I always tell the chaplains. I mean, our, there's many, many duties in the life of a Catholic chaplain in the military. Um, unbelievable range of things that are asked of them. But first and foremost, with the presence of Jesus among the troops, because he wants to be with them. Yeah. He desires to yeah. be with them, to minister to them, to love them. It's a, it's a difficult life, yeah. you know, serving in the military. It has a, requires a great deal from someone personally and from their family. And so we need to be the heart of Jesus ministering to them. Yeah. Jesus doesn't want anybody to be alone wherever they are. He wants to be with them. Absolutely. Well, Bishop Scott, you gave a very inspiring talk a little while ago in Toronto at our mm. annual Lift Jesus Higher rally. And uh, people have been talking to me about it. I was I couldn't be there that last year to hear you, but uh, people have been talking to me about it ever since. And we fortunately videotaped it. So we're going to play a little six-minute segment of your preaching, and then we're going to talk about it. Excellent. Good. Our Lady said that Portugal would retain the faith. Well, it survived the assault on faith. The Masonic Republic of Portugal fell in 1926. And though it's suffering now under the new assault of secularism, it remains a Catholic nation. And finally, she promised a miracle. And she promised it months in advance at the site of the apparitions. And that's exactly what happened. On October 13th, approximately 70,000 people were present despite the persistent rain and muddy roads that made travel difficult. Many of them were unbelievers and journalists who showed up specifically to see that there would be no miracle so that they could report that the whole thing was a hoax. At around one o'clock, Lucia, prompted by an inner voice, instructed the crowd to close their umbrellas despite the rain and start saying the rosary. At 1.30, she announced that Our Lady was there. And then at the end of the apparition, as Mary was departing, Lucia pointed up and shouted, Look at the sun. Look at the sun. And the sun, a silvery disc, could be looked at without hurting the eyes, and suddenly it began to dance and spin in the sky, throwing off colors in all directions. In unison, the crowd shouted, Miracle! Miracle! But then that elated crowd turned suddenly terrified because the sun began plummeting towards the earth at blinding speed. Believers and unbelievers alike fell on their knees begging God's forgiveness, at which point the sun returned to its place in the sky and returned to its normal sight, its normal place and appearance. And in the meantime, inexplicably, everything that had been soaked with rain for days was dry. Clothes, ground, everything. It could be seen up to 25 miles away and the entire population of a village witnessed the miracle of the sun. Even the editor and chief of the anti-Catholic secular Masonic newspaper called O Secula reported what he had seen and that it defied all laws of the cosmos. The miracle of the Son, like the miracles of Jesus in the Gospels, was given to substantiate the truth of the message. And there's a lesson in that too. See, that's the primary reason. There are other reasons. God wants to console and do all sorts of things for us and heal us and be with us. But the primary reason for signs and wonders is for unbelievers. So that they can see the truth of the message. I think a lot of us... Oh, we'll pray with people, but we'll pray with people who are already believers. It's a little dangerous to step outside that safe zone and pray with somebody who maybe is not so sure or doesn't believe. Oh, but that's where you're going to see God move. That's where you're going to see the miracles. That's where you're going to see the signs and wonders. Now, Lucia said that Mary appeared, quote, a lady clothed in white, brighter than the sun, radiating a light more clear and intense than a crystal cup filled with sparkling water lit by burning sunlight. Wow, that is beautiful, isn't it? Doesn't that sound like a whole lot like a white dawn before an everlasting day? And true to form, 
She pointed to something greater than herself or what the future might hold. She pointed to her son and to his urgent warnings to the world. At a time when atheistic ideologies were on the offensive, feeding anti-Catholic politics and sweeping many away from their faith and morality, not just in Portugal, but throughout Europe and many places in the world, Mary reminded us of something that had been forgotten. Sin is deadly. Sin is deadly. She warned that, quote, people must amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not offend our Lord anymore, for he is already too much offended. She said to believers, sacrifice yourself for sinners. Bear sufferings as an act of reparation for the sins by which Jesus is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners. You want the right attitude to suffering? There it is. Pray for healing. But if that cup is not meant to pass you by, then use it. Don't waste it. She asked for this prayer. After each mystery, when we say the rosary, we all know it. Let's say it together right now. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need. And finally, she showed the children a terrifying vision of hell, where she said, poor sinners go. Now, if I may pause here for a moment, there are a number of popular preachers and theologians that claim that in the end, everyone will be saved. That the love of God is just too powerful and beautiful for anyone to resist. Now, I have to admit that that is an appealing idea. Oh, that is a consoling idea. And I really, with all my heart, wish it were true. I really do. But there is a problem. And here is the problem. First, we are made in the image of God, and that is an awesome thing. What it means is that we have the godlike power to say yes or no, even to God. Even to God. It's not real freedom if you can't say no. As well, we know that many did say no. Many angelic beings said no, the demons, and they are eternally lost. Most importantly, look at the seriousness and the frequency with which Jesus warned us about hell in the Gospels. This is not a man-made idea. Getting back to our topic, if it were true that nobody goes to hell, why would Our Lady request so urgently that we pray and sacrifice for sinners who are risking eternal damnation? And not just at Fatima, but at almost every single one of those approved apparitions. Man, that message comes through like a, like a drumbeat in these messages from heaven. No, it seems pretty clear to me that Mary is acting as prophet. These warnings for heaven are calling us back to fidelity to the gospel and the words of Jesus. To the sobering truth that this life is not a game. No one can say how many are lost or saved in the end, only the Lord, but Jesus and Mary do seem to be making something crystal clear. As I said, this is not a game. Sin is deadly. And, and here's the end, the important end, we all must play our part and every one of us has a part. We must all play our part in the Lord's mission of mercy. Jesus is still reconciling the world to the Father. Only now he's doing it through his mystical body. And guess what? You're it. 
For those who are just joining us, perhaps in the middle of that video clip, uh, we're talking to Bishop Scott McCaig, and he was speaking about the appearances of Mary at Fatima back in 1917 to three little shepherd children, Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia. And the amazing thing that happened there, the miracle of the sun, but also the amazing message that Mary gave about, hey, this is for real, this isn't a game. I mean, there really is heaven, there really is hell, and it really matters, and we all have a mission to help save souls. Bishop Scott, that was very inspired preaching. Uh, really, I, I think there's an added element of authority now in your preaching, <laughs> now that you're an official successor of the apostles. Well, it's, uh, it's a message that's very clear to me, or very dear to me, and it has been for, even since my my conversion, my initial conversion to Catholicism, um, I was reading, studying, trying to understand the faith. But messages such as those of Fatima and Lourdes and other places that are approved apparitions added a credibility. Uh, you know, heaven is speaking. God is not hanging in a hammock somewhere between the stars, <laughs> yeah. minding his own business, but yeah. very much actively involved in what's happening in the world. And um, you know, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the reason for private revelation is not to add anything new to public revelation, but in every age to point us back to things that perhaps we're neglecting or we've forgotten, things that, that have slipped out of the conscious you know, understanding of the church in any particular time. And uh, so these messages of Our Lady over the last 150 years, those which are approved, now a Catholic doesn't have to believe them, we're required to believe the Word of God, yeah. you know, Scripture and tradition, as, as uh, taught authoritatively by the Magisterium of the Church. But nonetheless, uh, they can point and enrich our understanding and point us back to truths that we're neglecting. Yeah, and the Church has given as the highest level of endorsement to Fatima and Lourdes and other things, having liturgical feast, you know, having popes go to Fatima and Lourdes, uh, and, and the many fruits that have come from them, from both apparitions that continue. I was, this is amazing, Bishop Scott, but le yesterday morning I got back from Fatima mm. and uh, I had been there maybe 15 years ago and it just, you know, I knew it intellectually, but this time like it just really connected seeing the graves there of Jacinta and Francesco and Lucia and, and the basilica there and being able to pray there and just remembering what the Lord had done there and, and hearing the story.